Hello and welcome back to Vanettes of an Eclectic and I'm going to have a very laid back Vanette that is going to be talking about three books specifically that I've been reading lately and the connective tissue between that. I was having a pretty bad mental health week and I decided to pick up Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, a book that I've been meaning to read for a really, 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 really long time. Uh, there's a list from 2017-2018 that I made about embarrassing classics I had not read <laughs> and it's on there. So yeah, I really wanted to read this but I've been putting it off because it's one of those books that, you know, I just expect to love and haven't had any rush to read and yet I have been getting into gothic horror and stuff like that a lot lately. So picking up this one was really good and what I didn't expect was a book from 1847 to have such realistic and emotional and introspective view on abuse, trauma, and depression and it is such beautifully well done and it's evocative and it's emotional and it hits me with the universality of suffering, the universality of experience in mental health, and that when they talk about mental health, like she does use the word depression, not necessarily in the clinical tense, but when we talk about like when people talk about mental health and it not being as big of a thing until like later on or in the 21st century, it's just like ridiculous. It's like read the books that have come through and they might not use the exact same language as us, but it's very clear this is what's going on. They're, they're processing trauma, PTSD, and these symptoms, even if they might use them in different ways or describe them. And I really connected with a young Jane and I'm only like 40 pages in or so, but I keep on having to stop and just write over and like write notes and think about it deeply because I'm already being moved by who she is as a person and the story that she's being told and she's about to go away to school. I also read in the last two days I listened to Kane which is by Jean Toomer and then I just finished Another Country by James Baldwin and these are books that I think are going to be linked because I read them back to back and I'm going to keep on thinking they're in the 20s even though Kane came out the year before James Baldwin was born which was 1923 and he was born in 1924. And they deal with a lot of different contexts, but they deal with it in very interesting ways. So Gene Toomer has an interesting past as his grandfather was the first man of black ancestry to be a governor of a state, the governor of Louisiana, I believe. And his grandmother was one of, at one point the richest woman of black ancestry. And they were on different sides because her father, who was her mother's slave owner, in, had her inherit his land, not his white children. And that was a big thing, and it actually caused a lot to happen where women and people of Black ancestry were just invalid to inherit things as illegitimate children as were their white counterparts, which was super cool that that happened. It was not cool the way that she came into existence, which was that her, you know, father raped her 12-year-old mother and that is not okay. It's it's very hard to talk about things like this and it's like Jean Toomer consistently did not want to be categorized as a black writer simply because not because he was ashamed or because he wanted to white pass but because of the fact that he thought that by distinguishing himself as either black or white he further eroded the harmony between them and this was in a time where the difference between black and white was becoming specifically very large and very uh, poignant in the time right after the Red Summer and right after World War I. And he's living in this time where race relationships are very different. And yet he is a man who is of mostly European ancestry, but is often seen as a black man for having the one drop rule, which is the idea that if you have one drop of ancestry, of black ancestry, then you are black, no matter how much of that is. And throughout his life, he goes between um, on official papers of being black or white, specifically because he married, both his wives were white, so he would have had to register as white, but in other things he registered as black. The only time that he willingly allowed the public or publishers or anything like that to identify him as a black writer was specifically for Cain, because it is very focused on the black experience and the legacy of slavery. And it looks a lot at um, early 20th century and what does it mean to live in the South? What does it mean to live in a place where he was really worried about Southern spirituality and the South being faded? And he really wanted to represent that through poetry. And it's an interesting, really interesting way of looking at it and looking at like an early novel in verse. And he's telling you stories. And even when it's not specifically like verse line, it is so evocative and so emotional. And I loved it and I'm looking forward to a time where I'm going to read it physically and be able to see everything. It has the hard ER a lot. I'm not a black ancestry, but my sister-in-law and my nephew are. It hits me very hard to hear that word. Another country deals with a lot of like, in order to deal with the racism and the sexism and the, um, the ways that we look at 
the Guan, we would need a different country. And this deals, we first see a lot of Rufus Scott, who is a young black man and his experiences with dating a white woman and his experiences with his family and his friends and these relationships. And it's hard because it's an assemble cast and it follows a lot of different characters and a lot of stories, but it's a really interpersonal view of sexuality and of race and of like inter- racial couples and of love and art and what does this mean? What does it mean to be an unpublished author? What does it mean to be a bisexual man or a bisexual black man? Does that mean specifically things? And it's really, really well done and I really, really loved it. I am slowly falling in love with James Baldwin, but I also find it really difficult to read his work because at times it's like, it's he pulls no punches, no punches absolutely in the way that he deals with really hard subject matter and really hard conversations. And I really enjoy that. And he also refers to penises as the sex, which is just, and his sex, which is just an interesting way of something that I have read way too many times now. But I read If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a book that came out 12 years after this. And that book was astonishment, astonishment, like incarnate, I guess. And I, I think I prefer that book, but another country is, it has less of a central figure, which makes it sometimes a less narratively, but it really deals with a lot of these questions. And I think that it's a book that definitely deserves more conversations in when we talk about books, because, you know, it's a book that talks very frankly about um, queer identity and race relationships in 1962. And that is when a lot of books, you know, don't have <laughs> as much of a spotlight in that time, you know, it was banned from importation into Australia and was, you know, banned in so many of these countries because the idea of even talking about these things was profane and obscene. And I think that it's interesting to look at a relationship between Toomer and between Baldwin because I kept on kind of putting it in the 20s, even though it's clearly not in the 20s because of the fact that I'd just written it and it deals with so many of the different issues. But when Toomer is dealing with the legacy of slavery, Baldwin is very much dealing with the, you know, the emergement of right near the time when segregation has just been appealed and stuff like that. And he's very much looking at, you know, the legacy of slavery is still obviously there and things like that, but it's a different time period. It's a different time period where you have these conversations around what does it mean to be a black man? I mean, a lot of it is about like white liberalism and how does this ignore the fact of like colorism and the fact around ig willful ignorance around race relationships and how hard it is and people not necessarily acknowledging even people who were friends with these people not acknowledging that their struggles are worse because they're black and that it isn't just like yes maybe similar things would have happened if they were white but they are made worse and they are intensified by the race relationships. And in many occurrences, this would never have happened in the first place if they had have had the privilege. And yet, it's interesting as the later half of the book primarily focuses almost exclusively on white characters. And we do have Ida, which is Rufus's little sister, but she doesn't really have a voice as much. Like, she is very much in other people's story, but she is shown through the point of Vivaldo and through Cass very much, who are the people whose we see in Eric. And he doesn't really talk about her very much. They don't interact very much. But we see these characters and we see their instances and what does it mean. And I guess they don't directly relate to Jane Eyre, but it does relate in many areas about the conversations of deep emotional and introspective things. And I am interested to read this on. And like, that's one of the things that always has made me uncomfortable because Bertha in Jane Eyre is a woman who is black and uh, I think mixed race technically. And of uh, idea in Haiti, I believe she is from. And yeah, that her father is white and her mother is black. And one of these things where the way that she's described is in very racist language and the idea of animalistic and these things. So I'm very interested, having read these books, to now go in and finish Jane Eyre and to th have these conversations. So these are my conversations on some books that are classics and my thoughts around them. Definitely not easy books to real deal with. They have, you know, suicide and a lots of lots of rape and assault and very explicitly and a lots of themes around there. But I really recommend them as books that are influential to the way that Harlem and the way that um, black literature was formed and 
I think are really important to have conversations about and are still very relevant today and are also books that are beautifully written and well written in introspective and realistic ways. So this is a section we're going to call clarifications and corrections because I'm not speaking from a script. I'm not always going to be exactly right. I'm just talking from the knowledge that is in my head. Like for instance, when I'm talking about Frida Kahlo, I know a lot of information about her. I've researched her and I love her. Same with James Baldwin. I've researched him quite a bit. So I know just general facts about his life. Gene Tumor, I had just come upon and had researched upon. So it was just fresh in my memory, but I didn't always know exact things. For instance, his grandmother's name, who was the first woman to be one of the richest women and inherited land from her father was named Amanda America Dixon, and his grandfather was the first one to hold office, was PBS Pinchback. And actually, his father, Nathan, abandoned him, and he was taken in by Pinchback and his wife. And his name, I believe, on birth was Nathan Toomer, and then he was adopted and became Eugene Pinchback because Eugene was the name of his godfather. And then Jean was short for Eugene, and then he took on Tumor when he became an author because he thought Pinchback was a lot of a lot, which I don't blame him. It's Pinchback. That's, that's I know you're a really cool guy and you made history and stuff, but like PBS Pinchback is, is a lot of a lot of name. And then I also have a correction because of the fact that I'm not American. I don't know American history like the back of my hand, and all of it is self-taught and stuff I've researched. So when I was thinking of segregation, I was specifically talk, thinking about Brown versus Board of Education, which was the court case that was from 1952 to 1954 that outlawed segregated schools and made way for Ruby Bridges to become one of the first students who was a black woman or girl at the time into a white school. And then I thought that segregation itself was dismantled in 1960, but it was 1964, which was actually two years after the time that this book was published. And he, and he actually started writing in 19... 19- 48, so many years before segregation had even started to be dismantled, and anti um, interracial marriage wasn't struck down until 1967. So, a lot of these things that even though I was talking about it being in the wake of segregation, it was actually still in the midst. Like, it was in the time when segregation was starting to be dismantled, but it wasn't actually constitutional for the entire country. I believe, I believe that New York had already struck it down and that's why we see integrated bars and restaurants throughout the novel of another country but I wanted to clarify that because I was wrong. Books referenced in the making of this episode include Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Kane by Jean Toomer, Another Country and If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. The Nets of an Eclectic is produced, recorded, and edited by Kier the Scrivener.